Hi, Stephen E. Andrews, Outlaw Bookseller here. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to the voice of SF experience in the front line in Britain's bookshops since 1984, selling SF, fantasy, horror, and every other subject under the sun you can imagine in books. It's small bookshops, large bookshops, medium-sized bookshops, mail-order bookshops, online bookselling. The lot, really. Everything you can possibly imagine. It goes on and on and on. 38 years of it, to be exact. Anyway, what are we doing today? Well, you might have guessed by looking here that we're looking at the career of Philip Jose Farmer. And recently, um, I get disconcerted when I see sort of people on YouTube online talking about Phil Farmer because I think the problem is, is that a lot of people say, oh, I read that, I was not impressed. And I hear that a lot, and that's usually because they picked up a Riverworld book or maybe um, World of Tears books, which have their definite merits i'm not going to dispute that but i always found with phil that his most interesting stuff was the stuff which people didn't read so much so we're going to have a look today at probably the sequence which i consider his most important work and the work through which he made the biggest contribution to genre fiction and literature per se because i think he did make a contribution well with farmer he emerged in the 50s, he was from Peoria in Illinois, and he emerged, uh, his career developed very slowly because he had some setbacks. One was around winning a prize, a magazine prize, and the prize never actually sort of came about or something, I can't remember the details, but his career took a while to get going. But in the 1950s, when his work still first appeared, he was one of the people who, at that time, and looking back, was a taboo breaker in terms of what you could say about sex, sexuality, Jungian and Freudian things in genre SF, in the magazines and early paperbacks and books and what have you. So he was quite important that way. So he was a precursor of the new wave. In a way, he's got certain affinities to Michael Moorcock because, like Michael Moorcock, Phil's sort of youthful passion was for Edgar Rice Burroughs. There's Tarzan. Now, it's all very well and good talking about Burroughs and talking about Tarzan if you haven't read this. So if you haven't read this, read it. I mean, you don't have to read all the Tarzan books. The thing with the RB, you only need to read a few. If you read the initial volumes in the key sequences, then you're laughing. You've got an idea of what they're about. So, but yeah, great stuff. And that's the original one. This is an old, um, what's this? who's this published by? Ballantine had this for about a million years. Love it. Great stuff. Lord Greystoke, John Clayton, noble man and noble savage. Straight away, you see, you're into the sort of philosophical stuff. Rousseau, the Enlightenment, the romantic reaction against that. So, you know, it all begins in, in the Western tradition as it emerges out of the morass of the supernatural, the religious, and as things start to get rational and bright and open. So it's all related to that. Yeah, it's a good stuff. So, <laughs> that bit of a philosophy aside for a moment. So yeah, it sort of began like that. It began with Burroughs as well for Moorcock. They both read very widely. And what they both did was Moorcock um, has this whole thing called the multiverse in which really all his books, all his fiction is related. There are nods to all sorts of other things. There might be a couple of short stories where maybe that doesn't ring true, but with all his novels, they're all connected through the multiverse. Even the mainstream novels, there are subtle nods all the time to Jerry Cornelius and Colonel Piat. So those things sort of come up as well. With Farmer, Farmer did something slightly different where he played a literary game where he tried to sort of very subtly and not in any sense of completism weave his own mythology in with that of other writers and he had great fun with that. So he was working recursively writing SF and fantasy about SF and fantasy and metafictionally writing fiction about fiction and he regarded fiction as a game and I'm always saying fiction is a game and you could have fun with it and the, th the great thing about this game is there aren't any rules to it and that's art for you as Brian Eno said art is the one thing where you can crash your plane and walk away from it it's not like sport or science or anything else there isn't a definable goal you can't measure success or failure except in commercial terms you can only look at the work itself and see if you as the audience relate to it and you get that meeting of minds between the creator and the the audience you know the third mind as william s burroughs and brian geisen call it so that's the only measure that's important what you think of it and if you enjoy the work so he did that and he sort of tried to sort of pull things together and he was somebody who generally I would say Farmer was a well above average sophisticated adventure fiction writer. He did try more serious things but really he was an adventure writer and this is the thing he was a jobbing author he did a lot of books a huge oeuvre. I haven't read 
as much as I should have. I've read an awful lot. I've read at least 40 books by Farmer, maybe a few more. There's plenty of things I haven't read, various singletons and what have you. And I found with this work that I tended to prefer certain things above others. And I preferred his more sophisticated literary work, which is probably his least, least successful commercially. You know, I've read all the Riverworld books and I like them, but to me, they do have a limitation. So I'm not going to talk about them today. I'm going to talk about some of his more unusual work, as I say. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the Wold Newton sequence. Now, the Wold Newton sequence, the basic idea of this is that it's, let's think, it's late 18th century Yorkshire and a town called Wold Newton. I don't know if it actually exists. I need to look it up. I think it does actually. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You can look it up for yourself. But there's a stagecoach carrying people and it's going along through the countryside and a meteorite crashes, irradiates the people and it mutates them and they pass the genes on. And these families in this, this stagecoach, they give rise to all the sort of superheroes and superheroines of literature and some of the mainstream figures as well. And Farmer comes up with this wonderful Wald Newton family tree. So it's basically where Alan Moore got the idea for the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen for. So there you go. And I'm sure he'd tell you that himself if you were sure. Alan, I don't have him handy, sadly. Never mind. So it is what it is. So we're going to talk about that today. Now, the Wald Newton sequence is a loose one. So it does help when you read the Wald Newton books and stories. There's a lot of them are short stories if you've actually read um, the works by the other authors involved. And basically, I would say the centre of the Wald Newton universe is, he said, trying to find some books, um, the two fictional biographies that Farmer wrote. Now, the, the fictional biography is a wonderful um, genre. It's very small. Um, probably the first one was Baring Gould's book about Sherlock Holmes, who, of course, didn't exist. So to write a biography of somebody who doesn't exist, I think is great fun. My mate Nick Renison, who co-wrote 100 Must Read science fiction novels with me and 100 Must Read fantasy novels, and he's the overall editor of the Bloomsbury Good Reading Guide series. Fantastic guy. I haven't seen him for ages. Novelist. You know, I mean, this man has read so much, it's not true. And we worked together as booksellers for a few years back in the 80s, early 90s. Lovely, lovely guy and brilliant collaborator to work with. You could never get anybody better. He wrote a biography of Holmes as well, which came out about 15 years ago. And that was great fun. So it, it does have a precedence. So what did Farmer do? Well, what Farmer did, being obsessed with Burroughs and with Tarzan, John Clayton, Lord Greystoke, he wrote this book, Tarzan Alive, the definitive biography of Lord Greystoke. I'm just going to pop it on the podium here, move some of these other flaky Farmer tiles so you can feast your eyes on it. And this is a uh, bison paperback. I think this is probably still in print. It's had various editions over the years. That's probably the best one it's had. Trade paper, because you see, and on the cover, beautiful painting of John Clayton, Lord Greystoke, Tarzan of the Apes, as he's known. And basically what Farmer does is he treats Burroughs as the biographer of um, John Clayton, and he draws on that as his sources and what have you. And it's great fun. It's all done very seriously, but the tongue is in the cheek. And this edition has lots of lovely extra things in it. I'm just going to take a look inside. Um, the, I, I love this. This really sort of tickled my um, my fancy and uh, <laughs> it's just great stuff. So you get proper biographical setup. And it's also the other material in here includes Tarzan Lives, an exclusive interview with the eighth Duke of Greystoke, which is a short story from one of Farmer's other books. Extracts from the memoirs of Lord Greystoke, which again is a short story, but of course they're written as if they're the real thing. And the interview one is absolutely fantastic because Farmer is there in a hotel room and John Clayton comes in and he describes this sort of Superman. And you know, it's all done very seriously, but it's great fun. So you get this wonderful biography. So that's the centre of it. Now, somewhere in this book, now I won't be able to find it now, I've said this, is the Wald Newton family tree. Now, I used to have, and of course there isn't one in this, so I have to show you in another one. That was the centre of it. And there's the other the other key book is Doc Savage, His Apocalyptic Life, which is there in Nice Old Panther from back in the day. And basically, I used to have a double day, I think, American first of this, and that had the family tree. This has got the family tree, so I'll show you now. So it's in here somewhere. As you see, perfectly prepared as ever. 
Right, okay. Now you're not going to see it in detail. This is an A format paperback. Uh, we're going to get the blurb. So that's the Wald Newton family tree. Okay, I'll show you that. You can probably find it online somewhere as well. And I'll just have a look at some of the names. So if we look closely, good grief, I definitely need new glasses. So I need to be wearing some in the first place. We have Manuel of Proctesme from James Branch Cabell. Um, we have, gosh, so I've got to hold this at arm's length. I do apologize. Scarlet Pimpernel, Leopold Bloom from Ulysses, James Joyce. So high art gets in there. Lord Byron, of course, is a real person. The Spider, Lord John Rockston, who, of course, was in um, The Lost World, my initial SF novel. Cordwain of Bird, which was Harlan Ellison's pseudonym when he wrote a teleplay and wanted to disassociate himself because of editorial changes. The Shadow, um, Count Cagliostro, the um, supposedly real magician. Um, Brigadier Gerard, another Doyle sort of character. Thomas Carlyle, literary figure, real person. Um, and it goes on Captain Blood, Alan Quarterman from Haggard. Um, let's see who else we've got. Kilgore Trout from <laughs> Vonnegut's books. I've actually got a book by Kilgore Trout, which I'll show you one day. Ha ha. You either know this joke or you don't. If you don't, you've got a treat coming. Um, Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe from Chandler and Hammett. Um, the Time Traveller from H.G. Wells. It goes on and on. So they're all in there. So that's the whole idea that these people are all related. And they're all sort of the mutant offspring of these people that are radiated by this meteorite. So it's a good science fiction conceit. And, you know, it's fiction about fiction. And he had great fun with this. And these are the two sort of cornerstones. The biography of Doc Savage, of course, is created by Lester Dent. And biography of Lord Greystoke Tarzan. So, not content with just fictional biographies, Phil decided to do his typical thing, which is to be the taboo-breaking character that he was in the 50s and early 60s and I mean one of his most famous book is probably The Lovers there's a short version published in the 50s and that's the full-length novel version and it's rather like the book The Lovers reminds me of it reminds me of A Case of Conscience by James Blish chap goes off to another planet and there he sort of has to sort of spend some time with this alien race and Earth is very sort of repressive and it's sort of like it's got his knickers in a twist about sexuality and things and when our sort of central character is on a starship going to this other planet um there's a guy called Pawnson who follows him around all the time who's like a moral guardian um which is quite funny Pawnson of course is obviously a pen and when he gets there he falls in love not Pawnson the protagonist falls in love with a woman there except well is she a woman or is she not we'll see so Farmer and Theodore Sturgeon were two of the people who looked at things, interspecies sex, um, different sort of gender issues, what have you, exposing the Freudian and Jungian underbellies of genre fiction. And they sort of really pushed the envelope and laid the ground really for the new wave guys in America in the 60s who could then bring in the swear words and, um, you know, and the direct sort of descriptions of sex and sexuality and what have you. So they brought that out into the open. So something I'd also compare these two is if you look at Norman Spinrad, if you look at the Iron Dream, the alternate history book about the alternate world where Hitler leaves the um, the German sort of thing and goes over to the, the States and becomes a science fiction writer. Again, that's a metafiction. That's a comment on a certain type of sort of sword and sorcery and a certain type of sort of neo-fascist SF, like right wing SF. And Farmer's in that ballpark. He's playing with it. Spinrad's a little bit more sort of dripping and savage about it um and sort of more incisive with pharma it's a little bit more of a joke but it's a good joke so as i say he decided to take things further and you know a jobbing writer he wasn't afraid to make money he had this reputation as a taboo breaker so what he really did then was he did different things with these different characters like for example there's a book called the adventure of the peerless peer which is Sherlock Holmes. And I've got that somewhere in a book called The Grand Adventure, which is a limited edition, which I'll show you when I do a limited editions round out. And that's great fun as well. You know, you get Sherlock Holmes shouting, you Fokker, at somebody in a German aircraft, that sort of thing. So it's got these sort of low jokes in it as well. But there's some high stuff there as well. But anyway, taking the sort of Tarzan and Doc Savage thing, what Farmer did was he then produced a trilogy, which 
I think, generally speaking, is his finest work. And I mentioned this on Matt's site, BookPill, the other day. And somebody did a rejoinder and said, actually, I don't think Feast Unknown, which is the book I'm going to mostly talk about, is Farmer's Best Work. Um, and <clears throat> I said, oh, I don't know. But I thought about it a bit more. And I would say I've always had a very soft spot for this book. And this is Lord Tiger. And I just see Granada. Beautiful. 80s. And on the back, it's got this wonderful legend, which I'll show to you and read you now. My mother is an ape. My father is God. I come from the land of ghosts. And this is about a character called Ras Tiger, who, as you see, looks rather like Tarzan. Yeah. And uh, this is a one. This is probably the best written of farmers' books, and it says that in the SF Encyclopedia. But I would agree the prose is of his highest quality in here. And basically, this is about a millionaire who wants to sort of create his own sort of lord of the trees his own Tarzan, his own superman and he sort of sets it up and it's a really great really great book and this really should be in something like golax fantasy masterworks but farmer was never published by golax so it's a right issue so the the masterworks list isn't definitive they've got most of the good stuff and a lot of the really old stuff they license from other publishers or it's out of copyright but farmer they can't because they never published which is rather strange because they publish most of the sort of good people but contracts are contracts farmer was published by all sorts of people sidgwick i seem to remember but i may be wrong on that mcmillan i can't recall um but there you go so that's a really good one and that's got a tiles and theme to it but yeah he wrote this trilogy which um doesn't really have a name you could call it the nine or you could call it the lord grandrith dot caliban trilogy and it begins with this book a feast unknown this is a rhino paperback i think this is from the 90s i've had various editions of this over the years and uh, this lovely a format and as you see it looks a bit sort of dodgy and this is um, a highly nasty unpleasant violent and dirty work of pornographic sf there you go i've warned you it's not for the faint-hearted the basic idea of A Feast Unknown and its sequels is that you have these two Superman figures in the Wald Newton universe. One of them is Lord Grandrith, James Clomby. So as you see, it does sound like Lord Greystoke, John Clayton. Um, and the other one is Doc Caliban, which sounds like Doc Savage, because Caliban from The Tempest by Shakespeare, the monster who was sired by the witch Sycorax and um, his dam sired is the wrong word because she's his mother but you know what I'm saying and basically they are the two sort of fulcrums around the, the way the trilogy revolves and they go up against each other because early on in the narrative Grandrith is a member of a secret society called the Nine who are immortals who he discovers are not really very good guys they're sort of power mad and hungry and corrupt and evil and what have you so it's classic good versus evil thing and what happens is that these two characters have never met and they meet and clash what they don't realize is that they're half brothers now there is a spoiler here but it's all over the internet because the thing is is it doesn't really matter because it's what got me to read it in the first place is that they're half brothers and their father is Jack the Ripper. And that's pretty much revealed, I think, about the first line or something like that pretty early on. And they clash. And what Grandrith and Caliban find is that they they both become impotent until they're performing acts of extreme violence, at which point um, they start to feel their loins surge. And again, it's a look at the sort of sadomasochistic and erotic impulses in fantasy fiction. So it's a comment on that. All the sort of symbolism of mighty thews and swords and all these other phallic things. It comes out in there and Farmer plays with that. And it's not for the faint hearted. You know, it is it is quite, quite savage book. And it was published initially by Essex House, who are a California firm, short lived who specialised in pornographic SF and fantasy. And you know, the finding that was is really hard. They didn't do many. And I think some of the later ones were then taken on by Play Playboy Press. Or it could be that they were an imprint of Play Playboy Press. I can't recall the details. And it's not important. What's important is the work. So that's A Feast Unknown. A few years ago, um, Titan Books sort of got the rights and issued loads of Walt Newton books by Farmer. And a lot of them have been widely remaindered. They ended up in... Um, sort of uh, Forbidden Planet and things and on remainder tables and stuff like that. It's a shame. And the thing is, because they are not a firm sequence with a running order, there's um, Feast Unknown in B format there in Titan. 
Um, it, it's a loose sequence. This is the whole thing that the, the wider sequence is loose. So that's that one there. So you can't pick it up without too much difficulty. And it's, it's a book I'm really fond of. I think it's very, very good. So it actually, despite its unpleasantness, is a very exciting read and very clever. And he really does get you thinking about the underbelly of these things, which is what that's all about. There are two sequels, which are, I think one critic said, these words have always stuck in my head anemic by comparison and I would say that's probably true but I'm going to show them to you now. The first of the sequels is well worth reading and as an adventure novel it's a great adventure novel I think one of the finest pure adventure novels I've ever read and that is The Lord of the Trees and this is Seven House Hardcover UK and it begins with this wonderful sequence where Lord Grandrith who as I say is pretty much Tarzan, has, has fallen out of, has been thrown out of a light aircraft and he's falling to his death. And it's first person narrative. And you think, how is he going to get out of this? And it's just brilliant. It really is very, very exciting. And it's a great adventure novel. It's about the fight back against the nine, this sort of evil cabal of immortals. And it's really great. And yeah, I, I just love this. And I love these Seven House books. I'm, I'm a huge Seven House fan. Mostly they went to libraries and they got an estate, but I've got a, a really, really nice one. So there you are. Ha ha. And the other day I talked about buying up a copy of the third volume, which is Keeper of the Secrets. There is a seven house edition of this, which I've always, shall I get it? It's not really that great a book. You know, they really, they really do diminish over time. But I bought this for old time's sake. So I haven't read it for years. There used to be a sphere sort of omnibus of the second two books. They've never been collected in one omnibus, all three of them, not that I know of anyway. Uh, those keepers of the secrets so i might get a seven house of that so that one is really is quite minor and it's sort of farmer in a sort of contract fulfilling sort of thing and he did a lot of books like this which are fine in themselves but they're not front rank and they're not his best books so if you're going to read farmer i say very much read a feast unknown make sure you read some boroughs and preferably some lester dent first you don't need to read a lot just get a basic idea of them and then you'll thoroughly enjoy a feast unknown it is for adults only so if you're under 18 you can't read it don't be naughty um <laughs> and this is a great adventure novel one of the great adventure novels i absolutely love it so there you go so that's the initial trilogy there are other things as well which I could talk about. Um, and the connections are web-like, as I say. But basically, whenever you come across a fictional figure created by somebody else in Farmer's Universe, you're pretty much looking World Newton. I mean, there are two books about Haddon of Ancient Opar, which look like this. And the Haddon books are basically, again, they're Tarzan related, called Opar as a city in um, in sort of Burroughs Tarzan mythology. And I think Fritz Lieber did a Tarzan book as well. And it's like a city of gold, you know, and what have you. And Haddon is a character who lives there thousands of years ago. And they're preceded by this book, Time's Last Gift. So that's the beauty of farmers. You're diving into it and finding the connections for yourself. So that's a brief sort of introduction to Wald Newton through the Grand Ruth and Caliban books. Um, just what else have I got you just to show you um, out of interest? Interest. So as you see, that's the leathers. That's hardcover first, I believe. Um, let's just have a look. Is this a first? I believe it is. It's Ballantine, Delray. Um, brief magazine version, 1952, startling stories. It's the days, wasn't it? And 61 revised, 79. So this is a first this. So it's a, so it's a first this. This is like a revised or so complete edition. And what have we got here? This is some, I bought this at the World Con back in 87 in Brighton. This is Down in the Black Gang, which is a farmer collection. I would say a lot of farmers' best work is the short fiction. One of the great stories, which I think is in this book, the book of Philip Jose Farmer. That's an Elmfield British one. This is common as muck, this book. You can get this everywhere. You can get it in Good Nick, even though you can get an estate, really easy to get. And it was a Granada and paperback. I think one of the stories in there is a story called The Jungle Rot Kid on the Nod. Farmer meshes the subject matter of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, with the prose approach and concerns of William S. Burroughs. So it's all about sort of heroin addiction and high strangeness and what have you. And the two things absolutely brilliant together. Classic of New Wave SF. So other things looking out for with Phil is, you know, there's lots of all sorts of odd things, you know. And I mean, these books like Flesh. There you go. I thought I'd show you that because that looks rather disreputable. Go for the disreputable looking ones. They're the most fun.
So that's a quick look at the Wald Newton sequence. Um, there are lots of bits and pieces. You can find resources online. Look in the SF Encyclopedia. I say that's a website these days. And, you know, delve into it because it's really great fun. But, you know, the Tarzan books particularly are absolutely marvellous. There is a lot more to Farmer. There's lots of other things. We look at some of his other work again because he is underrated these days. And I personally think that's because, certainly in the UK at least, um, he hasn't got anything Gollum's Masterworks. And, and you know, there's, there's more to life than Gollum's Masterworks. But... You know, it's a it's a real shame that this sort of whole tranche of Titan was just didn't work. But they were too slippery for sort of readers who are used to being spoon fed and having which is the first in the series and all that stuff. You know, you you know when you get with people like Moorcock and Farmer, you've got to take a more sophisticated approach and you've got to dive in and be prepared for some chaos because that's what the fun is. Anyway, the Outlaw bookseller trying to encourage you to embrace the um the sort of anarchic spirit of PJF the wizard from Peoria, signing out for now. Bye.